My name is uh, Dennis Gonzalez. Um, I'm a retired scientist now, but um, I uh, retired from Cornell in 2012 and uh, went back to the Big Island on Hawaii to direct the USDA Research Center, the USDA Pacific Basin Agriculture Research Center. I left in 2002, I'm sorry. And then I retired at the end of 2012 from USDA. I just come to Cornell in 1978, and I went back to Hawaii where I was born and raised, and they told me that, you know, there's this virus disease on the Big Island where 95% of the papaya is being grown, and this virus disease is only 19 miles away, papaya ring spot virus. And what would happen if the virus got into the main papaya growing area? I said, it would be ruined. So in 1970, that started our research efforts to try to develop control. And the first part was just to characterize the virus. But starting in 1985, we started in earnest to try to develop a virus-resistant transgenic papaya. And lo and behold, in 1991, um, we had successfully introduced the code protein gene of the papaya ring spot. And our mechanism was just like vaccination, that we utilized part of the pathogen to develop a plant that was resistant to it. So we got the cold protein gene, cloned it, and got it into the papaya using the gene gun. And in 1991, the, I was working with, again, the University of Hawaii, um, USDA, a graduate student there, and Jerry Slidem from the Upjohn Company. And um, 1991, we had uh, some genetically engineered papaya in a greenhouse in Geneva, and one line was called line 55-1. And I'll never forget this day. I went down, had all the clones of this line, and I inoculated them with the virus. And two weeks later, I go by and say, hey, my gosh, these papaya is growing very well, whereas the control that had no genes was not. And that was the start of getting success after six years of research. We had developed the papaya in 1991, started field testing in 1992. The virus entered the main papaya growing region in 1992 and, and chaos. By 1994, all of the, um, that area where 95% of the papaya was grown was, was being infected, but we had a potential solution we did the research, it's just like a football game. You started the zero yard line, you want to develop resistance. Oh, you got resistance, you tested, you're down at a 20 yard line. And in football, they call that what? The red zone. This is where you differentiate the men from the boys. You're either going to score or you're not going to score, especially when there's only two minutes left in a football game. Well, that's what was happening in Hawaii. The industry, by 1998, had lost half of its crop. All of the papaya were infected by the virus. We had a potential solution, but how can we get it to the growers? We worked through deregulation, we tested it for safety and all of these things. And in May 1st, 1998, literally six years after the virus entered Puna, where 95% of the papaya was being grown on the Big Island, we released the seeds of the rainbow and the sun of papaya to the growers and essentially gave them free. It was done all by public sector. And it's really the only public sector transgenic crop that has been commercialized and for sale. So in short, that's a papaya story. But fast forward to now, 1998 is what, um, uh, 14 years later, um, it's uh, the transgenic papaya occupies 85% of Hawaii's production. So it literally uh, saved the industry. So that's the story. And, and as you can see, Cornell had a huge part of it. It, it, it. The 25 years I spent at Cornell was like magic. I mean, it, the atmosphere was wonderful. And, and that was a big part in having us succeed. This kind of work is not for the faint-hearted. 
this kind of work are for people who have a passion they want to help people and my take is um, when you put the human part of biotechnology into the equation then it's easier or when the goings get tough it's easier to continue the work because you're trying to help people too many people just think is this as a technology no it's just a tool that we utilize to improve the lives of people and uh, even today a lot of older people in Hawaii come up to me and they say hey Dennis I'm so happy you worked on the papaya because I eat papaya every day it's very good for the digestive system of all the fruits in the world it's in the top five for its health and and it's cheap it's 89 cents a pound in the market and you go to the farmer's market for papaya for a dollar incredible and that's why 85 percent of hawaii's papaya is genetically engineered and the people love it everybody say nine billion people we have to feed the world can biotechnology help absolutely i think it's one of the most powerful tools especially against working on diseases and you know diseases are a crucial part of food production viruses bacteria fungi and all of this stuff so the technology the science has moved the technology is there so potentially is huge to help as a tool to help to feed the world um, so I don't think it's the technology whether it's is there or not is there but Will you be able to translate this technology so that you're actually feeding the world, especially the third world? The public sector, their job is to help the people. Their job is not about making so much money. And that was the model of Geneva, Cornell, that's why we did the papaya work and all of this stuff. And, and that's still their job. Yes, if it costs a lot of money, then you may not be able to do it. Well, but it's still your job. Now, if, if you're going to concede that it costs too much money, and, and, and then it becomes the pur purview of what? Only the big companies. And the big companies are going to do what? go after crops, they what? Make money. They're not going to go after papaya or after grapes or, or after tomatoes, late blight resistant tomato. Who's going to do it? Cornell should do it. Cornell should do it. How are you going to do it? I think you can do it. That's what I tell people. Hey, we've done it with papaya. I mean, we, we, we weren't any brilliant people. We were just ordinary scientists trying to do a job. But you can do it. But if you rationalize yourself from the beginning, th then you don't do it. I feel the public sector plays a big part. Um, uh, but outside of the papaya, th 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 there's no other examples of the public sector. I know they have the transgenic plum, but that hasn't been commercialized yet. But So the worst case scenario, if the public sector doesn't step up. I don't worry with the private sector. They're going to do this stuff. But companies in this country of the U.S., what's the driving force? Capitalism. You don't make money. The companies are not going to survive. So they're going to look at stuff that make money, which may not necessarily be the stuff that's sustainable. So the worst case scenario is uh, GMOs will, will keep on going, um, but I think if the public sector doesn't move forward with the minor crops, the specialty crops, then, then uh, they, they'll keep on improving the commodities where they can make money and so forth. And um, yeah, so I, I think it'll keep on going, but you will not get the diversity of stuff and the people will not get the privilege 
to see the diversity of things. I mean, people will not get a privilege to say, oh my gosh, I can eat, I can buy four papaya for a dollar. Four papaya for a dollar in Hawaii. That's the cheapest, most healthy fruit. And it's only because of the virus resistance. So that's the scenario I move forward. Um, uh, the, the big companies will choose their products because their aim is to make money. And so the, the public probably may not get that much of a say because um, a lot of the commodities are stuff, they, they are in ingredients, it's not in things that they, they can feel and touch.